Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us from. Thanks for joining Echo Diabetes in the time of COVID. I'm Dr. Nick Cutris, um, pediatric endocrinologist and director of this program. We're grateful for the unrestricted educational grant that we, re we received from Novo Nordis and Pfizer to make this grant possible. Our goal is to address the urgent needs of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes who require complex diabetes treatment in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. We want to empower primary care providers and clinics to safely and effectively manage underserved patients who do not have access to routine specialty care. Even before COVID-19, outcomes for patients with diabetes were suboptimal. We must recognize that poor outcomes for people with diabetes on a population, population level do not reflect patients' quote, non-compliance. This is ra rather system failure. And as providers and as a health system, we must change our approach to focusing on diabetes outcomes and costs. Data from over 190 million people enrolled in health plans that report heat as results to the National Committee on Quality Assurance illustrate that system failure for patients with, di uh, type, uh, with type 1 and type 2 diabetes is uh, prevalent. Not only are patients not meeting outcome goals of A1C, but 30 to 40 percent of patients are reporting A1C targets over 9 percent. Minimizing hyperglycemia is paramount to reducing diabetes risk and vulnerability to infection and co complications, including COVID-19. Now is an opportune time to overcome therapeutic inertia and make meaningful system changes so that patients are able to achieve glycemic targets. We are living in unprecedented times with COVID-19, but systemic racism and health inequalities have been endemic to the U.S. COVID-19 is making these injustices more clear. We must come together as a medical community and change our practice. We must act. When the mortality rate from COVID in Black Americans is at least two times, if not five times, as high as the mortality rate for whites, we must act. When marked racial disparities in diabetes management exist and prior to COVID-19, we must act. When Black Americans with diabetes with equivalent socioeconomic status as white Americans are less likely to be prescribed intensive insulin management regimens and diabetes technologies and other therapies to improve diabetes outcomes and mitigate diabetes risk and complications, we must act. We must act and recognize systemic racism and implicit biases that are also occurring within our medical community and our individual practices today. Our leadership team and the faculty are committed to promoting health equity through the program and combating systemic racism in the U.S. We are committed to action. I, I invite you to join um, Diabetes uh, Wise as just an example uh, of an opportunity to uh, refer your patients um, to address disparities in diabetes technology uh, use. Uh, through, and this is a new series that has started um, uh, Wednesdays. Here at Stanford, we're partnering with Project ECHO and other sites across the U.S. on this series. Project ECHO is a globally recognized hub-and-spoke outreach model developed at the University of New Mexico to reduce disparities and improve health outcomes in patients who otherwise lack routine specialty care. Zoom-based clinics led by multidisciplinary faculty from medical centers and community organizations provide providers with education, case-based learning, and expertise they need to treat, treat patients within their own communities. Our presentation agenda will be responding to a question from last week's session, a lecture followed by a submitted case presentation from the community, and then we'll address pre-submitted questions from the audience. A bit of uh, housekeeping for this webinar, please use the uh, Q&A feature in Zoom to submit uh, questions. Please use the chat feature if you have um, resources uh, to, to share or having technical issues. Please note this session is being uh, recorded and will be available a few weeks um, after this program. Uh, please visit our um, uh, website for additional resources on the series and, and, and resources for patients with diabetes and primary care providers in the time of COVID. Um, and lastly, if you want to claim um, uh, CME credit, please uh, visit the, the link that will be emailed to you after this session. 
Our ECHO webinar is a safe place for everyone. We have a zero tolerance policy for language that is discriminatory, disrespectful, racist, sexist, bullying, or offensive. As such, any participant will be removed from the webinar if you engage in any such behavior. Thank you for keeping uh, this program a safe space for all. We have an exciting series yet to come with excellent relevant topics. As a reminder, you and other learners are welcome to drop in for any one session. Next week, we'll be featuring diabetes disparities in the time of COVID-19. You can, uh, as a reminder, you need to register for each individual session uh, on our website. We're fortunate to have a dynamic faculty representing ECHO programs from over 13 states. I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, sharing my screen um, and um, uh, introduce our faculty. Uh, and we'll just go by state and I'll start with uh, our um, team here at Stanford. Once again, I'm Dr. Nick Kutras, pediatric endocrinologist and director of this program. Uh, Linda. Hi, I'm Linda Baer. I'm the director of education for the program and I also have type 1 diabetes. Welcome. Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Town and I am the program manager. I am a nurse and a diabetes educator and I have type 1 diabetes. And moving on to our faculty at Stanford, Marina. Um, hi, I'm Marina Bassina. I'm adult endocrine faculty here at Stanford. And Magdalena. Hi, I'm Magdalena Ford, and I'm a family nurse practitioner with Stanford's Adult Endocrine Clinic. Good to see everyone today. Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse Wong, and I'm a diabetes psychologist at Stanford University. And Rayhan. Hey there, guys. Rayhan, I'm an adult and pediatric endocrinologist here at Stanford, and I also have diabetes. Also in uh, California, Jay. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Welcome aboard. Jay Schubert, primary care diabetologist at Toro University, California. And also in California, our patient advocate, Kelly. Hello, my name is Kelly Close, and I'm editor of diatribe.org. And moving to Florida, Eleni. Hi, I'm Eleni Sheehan. I'm a family nurse practitioner and diabetes educator at the University of Florida, and I also live with diabetes. And Dan in Hawaii. Uh, good morning. I'm Dan Saltman. I'm a, a primary care internist and an associate clinical professor at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. And to Iowa, Dave. Hi, my name is Dave Faldman. I'm a physician assistant work at a fed federally qualified health center. All right. I think we lost your audio uh, uh, there. Um, and to Nebraska, Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie Island. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of Nebraska in Omaha, and I also have type 1 diabetes. And to Maine, uh, Erwin. Hi, I'm Erwin Brodsky. I'm an, an adult endocrinologist at Maine Medical Partners Endocrinology and Diabetes Center um, and an adjunct scientist at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. And to New Jersey, Mary. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Bridgman. I'm a clinical professor at the School of Pharmacy at Rutgers University and a pharmacist at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. And to uh, New Mexico uh, at the ECHO Institute, Matt. Hey, I'm Matt Bouchonville. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of New Mexico. And to New York, uh, Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa Desimone. I'm an adult endocrinologist at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. And to Washington State, Savita. Hi, I'm Savita Subramanian. I'm an adult endocrinologist at the University of Washington in Seattle. Great. Thank you all for, um, uh, for joining. Um, and before we move on to our um, didactic, uh, once again, each week we address high impact follow up questions. And we had some um, follow up questions on. Uh, depression and how, uh, and the question was how depression may affect or worsen diabetes control during social distancing and stay at home orders. Um, Jesse, do you want to, uh, I'll go ahead and, and pass the mic off to you. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. 
So depression and diabetes distress affect diabetes management in at least two main ways. Through the mind, by making the person less motivated and interested in diabetes self-management, and through the body, because the person is less likely to be active and to be able to complete tasks. And it's important to acknowledge that depression and distress are problematic factors even before COVID-19. But due to the current pandemic and social distancing and stay-at-home orders, these effects are likely exacerbated. And there's a few mechanisms that explain that. One is with everyone being less physically active, that can lead to more depression. Also, people's eating patterns and sleeping patterns are very different under the current conditions than they have been in the past, which can lead to less motivation, which can lead to depression and distress, as well as limited motivation to try and change those patterns. Um, and there are very few changes in daily routines and distractions. A, a lot of people describe feeling like it's Groundhog's Day, which also um, exacerbate these effects. So, you know, the thoughts that people have that might make them more depressed or distressed or feeling down about diabetes, those can become even more challenging to ignore. Um, also, a lot of people with diabetes are especially concerned right now about their health. So even when there are conditions for them to possibly resume activities, they might be nervous and um, reluctant to do so due to those concerns. And then lastly, a lot of the social support networks that may have helped them manage their depression and diabetes distress and diabetes self-management in the past may have changed or could possibly be gone altogether, like face-to-face -face support groups, interaction with peers. Um, and so with all of those together, you know, I strongly encourage everyone to really monitor for depression among their patients either through asking questions about these factors in their lives or just generally about how their mood has been and also possibly through data reports. So like, you know, depression screenings and things like that. Um, and to also in connect your patients with a behavioral health at the first sign of depression or distress, or even if you see a number of these risk factors there, but that maybe they aren't endorsing as much de depression or distress at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And just as a, um, a call out, we're going to be having a, a, a dedicated session and, and didactic topic on diabetes, distress, and depression um, in the time of COVID. And that um, session is open for registration in August on our website. Um, and now we're going to move on to the uh, didactic uh, portion of our uh, webinar. And I'm, I'm so privileged to have and introduce Dr. Ann Peters, who's a professor of clinical medicine at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California and director of the USC Clinical Diabetes Program. She runs diabetes centers in Beverly Hills and in underserved East Los Angeles. In addition to her clinical work, she has been a principal investigator on multiple grants and has written over 200 articles and four books. She has been on multiple guideline writing committees for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Her major, major interest involved translating research findings from lifestyle interventions to technology the people with diabetes throughout the socioeconomic spectrum. She lives between Los Angeles and Montana, um, and it's um, a privilege to have you, in. And I'll pass off the screen sharing features um, to you. Um, and as we um, uh, transition to your slides, as a reminder, um, if you have questions regarding the, um, uh, the didactic, please go ahead and type your question um, in, and our faculty will respond. Um, after the didactic, we'll open it up for uh, questions um, and allow you to um, um, uh, ask questions directly to Dr. Peters. If you have uh, resources to share, please put that in the chat box. Um, and take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So you can see my screen and everything all right. Is that true? Everything's Yep, good. looks great. Okay, I'm never sure. All right. So first of all, it's a real honor to speak with all of you. Um, and second of all, I know I'm supposed to talk about medications, but just first of all, for one second, because of this wonderful introduction that you heard, I have to talk about what I do for a living. So I work, as you heard, in well-served uh, Beverly Hills, the west side of Los Angeles, where I have insured patients who have access to all sorts of things, including telemedicine. But the other half of the time, I work in East Los Angeles. And in East Los Angeles, where I work, is the very epicenter of COVID cases for LA County 
which as a county is doing very badly. But I work in the heart of this. And I work at a comprehensive health center where I've been seeing patients with diabetes for 20 years. And I spent my whole career working part of my time in underserved communities and dealing with health and disparities, but I've never seen it like it is now. It has been decimating that community, both in terms of their outcomes, the number of patients who are getting COVID, but also the horrible economic fallout. So I still go to work. I still go to work in East Los Angeles because many of those patients don't have access to smartphones or computers. And I am very aware of this issue of how healthcare disparities are really playing out in a place where I've been working for a very long time. So I am very aware of this. And what I'm gonna to try to teach you is what I know from seeing patients in basically both practices, but um, it's just been a really big concern to me as to what's really happening in terms of all of the uh, coexisting issues, both the emotional issues, the psychosocial issues, the economic issues for our patients as they deal with this pandemic. Um, these are for my financial disclosures. And these are the stated objectives for my talk. I'm gonna talk about different non-insulin therapies for diabetes. I'm gonna talk about patients who may benefit mostly by telling you about my own patients. I'm gonna discuss risks and benefits, contraindications, but I'm also gonna tell you my own paradigm for using these agents in the treatment of patients with type two diabetes. Now, from the very, very beginning, from when we started to hear from China that there was this uh, novel coronavirus that was affecting people, it became obvious that people who had diabetes who were hospitalized did worse than others. Now, diabetes was just one of another, uh, amongst other coexisting comorbidities, but diabetes came out I think from the start and before we really started seeing this to a large scale in the United States. But as we started to see the pandemic come to the United States, we began to see that patients in New York and other places were again seeing diabetes as a very significant comorbidity. This is from the New York Times on March 10th, which was early in this, and they talk about those with chronic health problems and how much more likely to die they are if they get hospitalized for COVID. And this is just recently from the CDC that looks at patients with underlying conditions. And they talk about how hospitalizations are six times higher and deaths 12 times higher for COVID patients with underlying conditions. And they state clearly cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and chronic lung disease. So what does that do for our patients with diabetes? Does that make us just, you know, want to say just throw up your hands, you're doomed? I think that's absolutely not the right message. And my message is always, we can do something to help you and we can do something to help you do better. And I think that that really leads us to what the clinical questions are, which is what can we do to reduce the risk of poor outcomes in our patients with type two diabetes? And then the corollary question is, are there differences among the different antihyperglycemic agents? Now, let me talk about the first one first. I really think that helping patients do better before they get sick with their diabetes is a good idea and can help improve outcomes. And there's a bit of data that suggests that. But I also obviously think that we need to really reinforce all of the good things that patients can do to avoid getting COVID-19. I know that my patients who live in multi-generational households in East LA have a much harder time avoiding transmission within the home. But I still think that patients can really be taught how to help themselves not get sick. But if they get sick, I think doing better in terms of glycemia will matter. Will matter. Now, this is an oddball database. It was published recently. Um, and this is the Glytech database, which they look at data that they have on glucose levels from hospitals around the country. And this looks at 451 patients. And they were subdivided into two groups. One those who had diabetes and high glucose levels, and those who didn't have diabetes going into the hospital who had stress-induced hyperglycemia of illness. And there actually has been even more recent data that says the patients without pre-existing diabetes who end up in the hospital with hyperglycemia do worse. And hyperglycemia in those patients is probably a sign of the severity of their illness. They're so sick that they get insulin resistant that they get hyperglycemic. But regardless, looking at these cohorts, the patients with pre-existing diabetes had an A1C of 8.7 and a mean glucose of 202. 
And you can just see here that the patients in blue who had diabetes or uncontrolled diabetes had a much higher mortality in these hospitalized patients um, than those who didn't. And there's another study that's been recently published that looks at patients whose pre-existing A1C was 8% or more or around 7%, and then they looked at glycemic variability within the hospital, and those with lower levels of glycemic variabilities and or a lower baseline A1C coming into the hospital did better. And I use this kind of data to really help patients say, look, you're home now, it's COVID, let's get your diabetes better controlled, let's help you with your lifestyle. And I think that people can actually have some sense that they can control these aspects of their care. So this is my first patient with COVID-19. He got this very early on because he had been traveling around the world. It's a 63-year-old male. His diabetes is well controlled. His A1C is 6.8. He's on semaglutide, empagliflozin, metformin, a statin, an angiotensin II receptor blocker. He had coronary disease and had a stent in his LAD. That was a number of years ago and is doing fine. He had developed symptoms of fever, cough, mild dyspnea, and fatigue. And he was tested and came back positive for having active COVID-19 infection. The first thing I did then, and I always do, and we're going to talk about this more in a minute, is I stopped his SGLT2 inhibitor. He's a relatively lean type 2, and because I was one of the people who first reported DKA with SGLT2 inhibitors, I'm always concerned about sickness worsening the risk for development of ketoacidosis. And in COVID, I see a lot of patients who they don't feel well, they don't wanna eat or drink as much fluid, they don't wanna eat much in the way of carbs. So I've seen more hypoglycemia, potentially some dehydration with people not eating and drinking. So I always stop the SGLT2 inhibitor in everybody when I first think they might have COVID. He ended up being hospitalized, but he didn't end up requiring ICU care. He felt pretty crappy. Um, and slightly nauseated, they were checking his glucose levels four times a day while in the hospital. And not only did he not have an increase in his glucose levels, he had something of a decrease. I held his semaglutide for the two weeks subsequently because he really just wasn't eating and drinking much. Um, so he was quarantined at home for two weeks after this hospitalization. As he got better, I restarted his empagliflozin and his semaglutide, and he's been doing fine. But He's the first patient where I thought, what do I do now? And the first thing I did was stop his SGLT2 inhibitor. Subsequently, I held this uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, but both are restarted and he's doing fine. Now, I just threw this study in about metformin because there is an idea that metformin may help in terms of its sex-specific immunomodulatory effects. So it helps reduce TNF-alpha and may reduce inflammatory cytokines, but this is sex specific. So it really helps mostly in women compared to men. And this is a big database study of 6,256 people that these de-identified claims came from the United Healthcare Database. And these are patients who had type two diabetes or obesity who'd been on metformin when they came into the hospital. And you can see here that those who are, were on metformin who were women, who were female, had a reduction in terms of their mortality um, compared to those who weren't, and there was no difference in men. And this just looks at two different ways to model the data, and in both uh, models, you see the improvement in women. So certainly for women, being on metformin in advance of ending up in the hospital is a good thing, so certainly don't stop the metformin in your women, but obviously not in your men as well, unless their EGFR falls to less than 30. Now, moving on, there has been a concern about the DPP-4 receptor in terms of coronaviruses. Now, we know that the ACE2 receptor is the entry receptor for SARS-CoV-2, and we knew from before that DPP-4 is the entry receptor for the MERS coronavirus, but it's not for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, there is an idea that maybe DPP-4, the receptor, could do good things for you. It's involved in the maintenance of lymphocyte composition and function. It can modulate cytokines, chemotimes, and other peptide hormones. Maybe DPP-4 is a good thing to activate, or maybe it's a bad thing to activate. So people wondered whether DPP-4 inhibitors were in some way either help or hurt you. But there's a really, really good long 
uh, discussion written by Daniel Drucker that looks at coronavirus infections and the shared pathways. It's an endocrine review and it was published in June. And to just summarize basically what he says is he notes that there are these two coronavirus receptor proteins, ACE2 and DPP4. They're established transducers of metabolic signals and pathways and all sorts of things. But if you look at all the evidence and he goes through everything, that he feels that there is little compelling clinical evidence that drugs targeting either of these pathways produce differential harm or benefit in the context of human coronavirus infections. And I think, as I said, this is a really thorough review. And I think it makes me feel comfortable using ACE inhibitors, DPP4 inhibitors, but not thinking that it's going to benefit patients more than I'm usually using them to benefit patients. So here's another patient. This is a 73-year-old male with type 2 diabetes. He had a TIA, hypertension, dyslipidemia. He has CLL and asthma. He came in to see me very early in all of this before we were wearing masks in clinic and doing all of the things that separated us to keep us safe. He came into my clinic. He'd just come in from New York City. He was on empagliflozin, citagliptin, a DPP-4 inhibitor, metformin, he was on basal insulin, degladic, and ARB, a statin, clopidogrel, and dupilumab. And he's the kind of person that while I was talking to him, I said, don't get coronavirus. And I talked to him about his risk and that I really wanted him and his wife to stay in a bubble. Little did I know that at that moment, he actually was act, act, actually actively infectious because he already had it. He had a BMI of 27, an A1C of 7.3, his elevated white count. He'd been with his wife, two daughters, um, and himself in New York City, and all four of them came down with COVID. And actually, he and his wife, as they were sitting in front of me, as we were starting him on a blinded libre, had coronavirus. He then disappears, and he calls the clinic, and he wants to send back the libre with his blinded data. But he's all worried about sending back the libre because he has coronavirus. Well, that's the first I heard of it. So I didn't even know at the beginning that he had coronavirus, I knew when he turned in his Libre. So I now have Libre data of somebody who had active coronavirus. And this is a guy with all of these comorbidities that you would think would do really badly. Well, he doesn't. And in fact, he doesn't even have to go into the hospital. Now, these are his glucose levels and he's on basal insulin. And basically what happens, and you can see this is from when he starts, he becomes symptomatic pretty much on Friday to Saturday on the 20th and the 21st, and you can actually see his glucose levels fall because as he becomes symptomatic, he doesn't want to eat and drink all that much. He stays on his empagliflozin, he stays on his DPP-4 inhibitor and his metformin, and his glucose levels actually go from averaging around 140 to averaging around 110. He's reduced his insulin here, he's self-reduced because his fastings have been coming down. And so here again is somebody who's sick, stays at home, is not eating or drinking much. So actually here, he's at risk for hypoglycemia. I would have um, helped him as he did reduce his insulin, but he also, I would have stopped his SGLT2 inhibitor. But he does well and he's fine, as are his wife and two daughters. So SGLT2 inhibitors have been linked to DKA and they can cause, as we know, dehydration and volume depletion. So I empirically stop them when a patient gets sick. And we obviously know that if a patient's in the hospital, you're very concerned about volume status. I wouldn't keep patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor in the hospital, even though they can have some benefits in terms of cardiac status, and you obviously want to follow the EGFR. Now, of course, I have seen euglycemic DK in the setting of COVID. So this is a 54-year-old female who has type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. She's on metformin and amphagliflozin. She's relatively lean and her A1C is 6.9. She develops vertigo and a low-grade fever. And this again was early in this pandemic, so I don't know if it's COVID, but I stop her amphagliflozin. But she keeps feeling worse. And the labs that have been drawn from the day before show that she not only has COVID-19, but she has diabetic ketoacidosis that's relatively euglycemic. So she's admitted to the hospital for her euglycemic DKA and treated easily with hydration and insulin. Her DKA resolves, she goes back home, she gets over the COVID and she's fine. So again, another patient where I'm trying to work with the diabetes medicines and here she does develop euglycemic DKA 
even though I'd stopped it the day before, you really have to stop it three days before, but it's really hard to predict when somebody's going to get sick three days in the future. GLP-1 receptor agonists, well, maybe they're good for you. And I think that it's possible that they have a positive effect on the inflammatory response, but I have absolutely no data to tell you that. And Dan Drucker may tell us that at some point, but we have no studies looking at them. I do know, however, the GLP-1 receptor agonists are great at reducing A1C, and I wanna keep people's A1Cs in a good level. I also wanna help them with weight loss because being overweight and obese is a risk factor. Um, and they're often easy because they're used once weekly. On the other hand, when you have a patient who gets sick, they will in essence still be on the drug if they are not just due for their once a week shot. So patients may end up hospitalized on their GLP-1 receptor agonist. But as I said, I'll often hold it if a patient's not eating or drinking. And this just looks at data relating the effect of BMI on the need for invasive mechanical ventilation in ICUs. This is from France. And on the left in the blue, you see the BMI is greater than 35, and they're at much, much higher risk for requiring mechanical ventilation than BMIs of less than 25. So I use this not in a bad way, but I tell patients, again, to really work on lifestyle and patients who are on GLP-1 receptor agonists before they get sick, if they get sick, I keep them on those agents. So this is what I think. When I look at the classes of drugs for treating type 2 diabetes, Metformin may be beneficial in women, so I certainly continue it in both women and men before, um, and I tend to stop them when metformin when someone gets into the hospital, um, but that really depends on one's policy, and you can continue them unless the EGFR falls to less than 30. In the hospital, I tend to use insulin, not oral agents, except for potentially DVP4 inhibitors. So finding urea agents probably have no great impact one way or the other, except people be can become hypoglycemic if they go through that phase of not eating and drinking. So I make sure that I watch for hypoglycemia in patients on sulfonylurea agents and maglitinides. DPP-4 inhibitors seem to me to be completely neutral, not bad nor good, but if someone's on them, they can continue them. And frankly, I think they're pretty safe to continue in the hospital if people want to do that. But again, most patients in the hospital are treated with insulin. SGLT2 inhibitors are the agents that I hold if a patient gets sick. And I don't even care if I don't know for sure it's COVID, I just hold it. It can cause euglycemic decay and dehydration. And I wait till someone's back to normal before I restart them. GLP-1 receptor agonist, I continue unless I'm concerned that it's interfering with hydration and nutrition. And then insulin again, because it can cause hypoglycemia, I adjust. Patients when they get sick enough to be in the hospital tend to have hyperglycemia. But as I showed you, these outpatients, when their appetite's reduced, they're not eating and drinking as much. You can really see falls in their blood sugar levels. I do a lot of monitoring with um, a continuous glucose monitor, which I can have patients get from their pharmacies. I mean, I really am concerned about people. Um, and I'm trying to make it so that the diabetes doesn't cause them a problem that puts them in the hospital like you, glycemic DK. I wanna treat everybody at home that I can and then reserve hospitalizations for patients who really need to be hospitalized for COVID infection. Um, this is just what the CDC has to say. The CDC basically says, as of recently, the type two diabetes and type one diabetes and a history of gestational diabetes increased your risk for severe infection from COVID. Um, again, they don't discuss A1Cs and we don't really have much data on A1Cs, but I think it's good to encourage patients to do as well as they can. And I follow the guidelines about taking medications, but I tell everybody to let me know or their healthcare provider to let them know immediately if they get sick, particularly if they're on insulin or any of these other agents so we can adjust and make sure that they stay safe. Then I tend to look at a variety of different sources for information. Kelly Close, who's on this call, is a wonderful source of information for all of us. I also look at this site from the American Diabetes Association where they have a lot of resources about COVID. I think it's really important that all of us keep up to date on what's going on for our patients with diabetes because again, they're in this very high risk category. And as we learn things, we may change our guidelines, but for now they're really as I stated. So my advice, once again, first sign of illness, hold the SGLT2 inhibitor. I increase self-monitoring of glucose if patients are on a sulfonylurea reagent or insulin. And if I can, I get them a continuous glucose monitor. I try to do that in advance if they're getting sick. Mind you, I don't expect people are going to get sick. I try to keep them from getting sick, but I want them to be prepared if they do. If patients have a reduction in glucose levels, obviously you adjust medications. 
Um, if patients have an increase in insulin resistance, you obviously need to deal with that. I encourage patients to have fluids on hand, carbohydrate-containing fluids is necessary so they drink enough. Um, I'll hold the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist if there's a reduction in appetite, and I continue everything else unless it's advised by somebody else or for some other reason that we learned that anything else isn't good for you if you have COVID. So that's the end of my talk, and I don't know if we have questions or discussion, but uh, I'll let it be up to you guys. Thank you so much, uh, and, um, and feel free to stop sharing your screen, and I'll go ahead and open it up um, for questions. And I was just um, monitoring the, the Q&A box, um, and we had great questions come in. Um, the first one, and maybe you could uh, readdress, there's some questions on metformin and, and difference in terms of the effects in gender. If you, if you could just elaborate on that a little bit more, um, I think some people would appreciate that. Well, I think as we all know that the men and women are not exactly the same, and women may have a somewhat different immune system than men, and it's complicated, but I think we don't actually know why there are some differences. But we do know what that metformin does have a different effect on the immune system in women than in men. And it may be because of the way the immune system is in an underlying way in women, but it's been shown before, but it's particularly been shown in the data that I just showed you that in women, if they've been on metformin, you see a reduction in those, you know, mortality if patients get COVID. So I don't know specifically why, I just know that it is something that we've known before and it's clear in this pandemic that there's a difference. Thank you. And then there's also some great follow-up questions on um, SGLT2 and risk for euglycemic um, DKA. And, and we'll, uh, the faculty, we'll, we'll put in the chat box some resources for different protocols for, for minimizing that. But do you wanna speak more to maybe just the etiology and kind of how that happens and, and maybe how to, minimize the risk as you kind of um, talked about a, a little bit um, already in your presentation? Okay, so I first saw euglycemic DK in patients with type 1 diabetes who'd been on off-label treatment with an SGLT2 inhibitor. And I thought it was just in type 1s, but as we began to use more SGLT2 inhibitors, we found that it could happen in people with type 2 diabetes as well. And it's usually in people who are relatively insulin deficient for type 2 diabetes. So it's in people who, with type 2 diabetes who may be on insulin, have longer duration disease, or who undergo things like general surgery. But regardless, it is basically a state of insulin deficiency. And it may be, and there are many, many theories about this, that the SGLT2 inhibitors themselves increase ketone body production. And if that's true, and you have relative insulin deficiency, and you give an SGLT2 inhibitor, which increases the production of ketones, you can end up seeing this euglycemic DKA. Now, it in part happens because you're peeing out glucose in your urine, so that's actually a safety mechanism in the sense that your glucose levels may not go as high as they would if you didn't have the SGLT2 inhibitor. So it's a combination of losing glucose in the urine, of having more ketones, and then having another stress, an illness, general surgery, that makes you insulin resistant. And it's not always euglycemic. So only about 40% of the cases are euglycemic and 60% can be hyperglycemic. But because we don't know, and because I don't want people with COVID to get DKA because I wanna spare the hospitals um, any additional you know, burden, I wanna make sure that patients just don't get euglycemic or hyperglycemic DK because of an SGLT2 inhibitor. So in those who are leaner, say a BMI of 25, I'm more concerned because those are more at risk. If a patient unbeknownst to us is developing type one, so that there are those patients getting what is commonly called LADA, who have autoantibodies who are progressing and seeming to go from type one, type two to type one, they may be more at risk. But just because of my caution, and I'm a very cautious person, I figure why not just stop them? You can hold them for a couple of days and then you can restart them, but I just don't want to increase that risk. And it, again, it's three days until the entire effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors out of somebody's system. So that's just my advice, um, but certainly a leaner individual and somebody who's on insulin or longer duration disease, um, that's somebody at higher risk. But you can hold the drug for a couple of days. So that's why I do it. And that's just me. It's no official advice. It's just my bias. 
And then there was a question that came up on, on type 1 diabetes um, and sick day management. And I want to uh, remind people, we, we, we had a separate um, um, didactic on that, which is now available on our website on demand in terms of um, titrating um, insulin during um, COVID and or other times of, uh, of illness. And um, I just want to open up to the faculty who are kind of answering some questions during this presentation. Um, if there's any other questions um, you want to kind of speak up to to address that were um, typed in? Hi, this is Marina. Um, I wanted, there was a good question about um, that study with metformin. Were there any other confounding factors noted in the study on gender differences, uh, such as differences in alcohol, smoking, recreational drug use between the gender of these patients? That's an incredibly good question, and we don't have that data because that wasn't available in the data. I didn't do the study, but it did not have that kind of granularity of information. There are all sorts of good questions to ask and answer that we don't have, but that's a very good one, and those could have a role as well. Hi, Anne. Great presentation. There was a follow-up question regarding if, we're, if we can uh, be worried about uh, DK in type 2, people with type 2, what sort of things should we be looking for if we're worried about that complication in general? Well, because most type twos don't have urine ketone test strips at home, all of my type ones do, by the way, for, especially for COVID, I just make sure they can check ketones. But in type twos, they don't have it. And usually what people see when they get DKA, because ketones give you a terrible headache, and they also feel nauseous and they can have a cell abdominal pain and the problem is if somebody gets significantly cut ketotic on an SGLT2 inhibitor, they actually have to go in most of the time for IV fluids and diagnosis in a medical center. So that's why I just blindly hold the SGLT2 inhibitor. But if, you know, if somebody can't keep down fluids, has a terrible headache, I mean, they can get that from COVID as well, but honestly, you have to diagnose it based on labs and that's you know, a problem right now. So that's just why I'm so cautious. Um, thank you. And we had also uh, talked about a, a case previously, just to, to remember, you know, COVID symptoms and DKA symptoms, they can overlap. We've seen lots of late presentation of, of DKA, thinking it's respiratory distress due to COVID, but it's actually Kuzmal breathing um, due to trying to blow off um, um, uh, the acidosis. Um, any other questions before we move on to the case presentation? There, there are some uh, specific questions coming in, in in the chat box regarding um, mortality, type 1 and, and type 2, um, and some pathophysiology on um, ACE receptors. Um, uh, and, and we'll go ahead and respond to that. Um, uh, some of them are a little more in-depth um, than we can address in, in one minute. Um, and we'll also uh, reference back to um, some previously submitted um, research uh, uh, we shared. Um, Dr. Peters, thanks so much um, for joining us. One of the questions uh, that uh, came in um, during registration, I can share my screen, is what are the risk and benefits of sending patients for routine labs during the time of, of COVID? Uh, Marissa, in New York, you all were hit uh, the hardest at first with this. Do you want to talk a little bit more about um, your recommendations and Sure, I animated this. So if you could just click the next one, please. So, you know, I think there really needs to be a balance, um, obviously, between routine lab testing during this time. Right now um, in New York, many of us are still seeing patients by telemedicine, and I'm sure you guys are as well. Um, and so, you know, some of the immediate risks that just came to mind were obviously, you know, anytime we're asking our patients to go out and do something, we're potentially exposing them to COVID-19. So that needs to be thought of. Um, for each individual patient and, and what that risk balance would be. Um, also, there's a big financial burden. Right now, people have lost their jobs or they're not making as much money as they used to and they're still having to deal with um, these expenses of uh, receiving their medical care. And so that could be a barrier to a patient. 
Um, and also, you know, we have to remember that emphasizing the A1C is not necessarily the whole glycemic picture. And are there other ways that we could still get the information that we're interested in without necessarily sending them to a lab for blood work? Um, there are benefits to lab testing. Certainly, if we're concerned about medication safety or monitoring closely, um, that's important and something that we don't want to uh, completely give up on during this time of COVID. And then there's also this desire of knowing what's going on. Patients and providers like to know that A1C. How are things going? Are my efforts working out? Um, and so I think that this really needs to be an individualized decision for every patient of when it's appropriate to send them for lab work, balancing that true need to know uh, what's happening on, on blood testing with um, what the potential risk could be. I think that COVID has offered us some really great uh, chances to sort of reevaluate. You know, we can re-emphasize to patients self-monitoring with glucometers. Um, our patients have been learning how to do their own uploads remotely, which a lot of them have really liked being able to see their data uh, for those who weren't doing that already. Um, this is a great time to consider and discuss continuous glucose monitors if you want to get that additional information so that you can really see what that glycemic time in range is. Um, and, and also educate your patients about time and range as a measure of glycemic management, and just making sure that they don't, uh, they, they understand that A1C is not the full picture. So those were my thoughts on this routine lab testing. If you need it, do it. If you feel like you can get away with waiting, maybe delay. Um, another thing that I've been doing is making sure I ask my patients if they have any other upcoming visits so that we can try and bundle lab testing with other providers so that they maybe only need to go once instead of twice, things like that. Great, thanks so much, uh, Marissa. And you know, now in the time of COVID, you know, patient reported outcomes um, as such as things as, as time and range and using CGM. Um, wow, if we can continue to be an advocate, uh, you all primary care providers of, of getting patients on this and, and reporting it, uh, what an accomplishment that'll be during these um, unprecedented times.